by the clock on the wall, it's time to start, but I think that thing runs fast or something, because 45 minutes doesn't run 45 minutes, it runs about 30, something like that. <laughs> yep. Well, if you would, uh, turn to the book of Jonah, and we'll... Uh, pick up where we pick left off last week the book of Jonah certainly good to see each one out and and it's a happy mother's day so for all the mothers that are in our midst we're very thankful for each and every single one doesn't come easy. One day out of 356 is just sometimes not enough. Scott's got his tie on, so he must be speaking today. Is it left over from Friday? <laughs> okay. Well, before we begin, uh, Scott, do you mind to say your prayer before we begin? prepared. Fred, you'll watch over each one of us. We thank for the beautiful weather you give us. Be with our sick. And watch over them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And it's certainly true. It's a beautiful weekend. We'll be wanting we- weekends like this in about a month. 70, low humidity, sunny. Yeah, 50 degrees at night. These are the good weekends we enjoy. And if it wasn't for good weekends, we wouldn't know bad weekends, or good days, we wouldn't know bad days. Bad days, we wouldn't know good days. So these are the good ones, and we'll take them and enjoy them when, when they la- as they last. So the book of Jonah. Uh, you'll remember we got down to um, the end of the first chapter. Um, we got to a question that I didn't want to gloss over because it's a very, very timely, appropriate question that we find Jonah running from God. We find Jonah doing the very opposite of the direction that he was given, which was go to Nineveh. And I had a slide on it last week, but instead of going 500 miles north to Nineveh, he goes 2,500 miles to the very edge of the earth as they had it at that time, as far away away as he possibly could. So instead of going 500 miles in the direction God told him, he goes 2,500 miles the opposite direction. And we asked ourselves some questions last week. Have we ever done that? Have we ever gone the opposite direction of what God had directed us to do? And we have. And sometimes we don't do the easy thing that he asks us to do. We do the harder, the more difficult. Stubbornness. It brings up all those things in our lives that we find ourselves doing. We found here then in uh, chapter 1, and I'd mentioned there's a lot of lessons other than we, we all know the lesson of Jonah because we teach the lesson from the age of our children at two and we tell them about the big fish and it's a wonderful illustrating story that we can tell our children and they understand it and they enjoy it but there's really so much more to Jonah than just that and the first lesson that really comes out is as he goes the opposite direction the the people that he comes across the mariners in chapter one and verse four and five is they were going to uh, the ed- ed- edge of the earth. Uh, they were going basically to Spain and to Tarshish. And they had their cargo on board, and we see that the great storm comes about. Um, and another lesson, I didn't say it, but it comes out that I, I said it, but I didn't say it, you know, that 
sometimes those that are around us that we're supposed to be that we are the Christian we're the ones that we're, we're, we're supposed to be living our lives godly and when we're doing the opposite and we're not doing what he asks it almost seems like sometimes people around us have more recognition of God than us and so these pagan people that he came across these mariners they they recognized God they, they prayed to their God they, they didn't do any good but then when he says that he prayed to his God and he was a Hebrew and they realized he fled from the presence of the Lord they recognized God and they at the end as we mentioned in verse 16 fearing God exceedingly offered a sacrifice unto him and made vows so sometimes a lesson that and we, we see people as we have lived our lives that you know don't live it accordingly as they're supposed to and, and the people around them seem to be more recognizing of God than us which is not the way it's supposed to be Dan you mentioned uh, that we sometimes you know run or go the opposite way uh, I think it's interesting of why he's going yeah why why he's doing this and and I don't prejudice is mm -hmm. a strong motivator in all of our lives uh, it, it's difficult to want to go to uh, the slums of you know st. Louis and try to uh, you know spread the word yeah uh, sometimes it's difficult to go to that neighbor that is we know is an alcoholic and you know and he's rough on his family and things to try to spread the word and, and basically that's exactly what is yeah. going on here yeah. and, and we can put ourselves in this spot easily yeah and we can and see how we react and are we reacting any different than he did yeah yep and we'd mention he could have justified by his great hatred that Assyria was about to overtake the children of Israel um, they had hatred to one another uh, Assyrians were brutal people they were going to overtake them too so the precedent was there I think preceding this but just like we read of Joel, Joel the repentance of a nation was necessary for the sin of the nation the Jews so Joel wrote out of Judah as we mentioned and it's only fair that here in a chronology of time now the next book is that Jonah I believe it's the next book that Jonah is going to the Assyrians not the chosen people but it shows the infinite now this is a point that the whole book surrounds is the infinite care that our God has for all of us is there and it supersedes me because that's what Jonah's thinking it's just me I'm not doing it I'm not going I hate them <laughs> they're gonna despise us they're gonna come take us they're gonna come hold us captive they're gonna exile us no that's his answer and it's 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 something that we too the infinite care of God supersedes me his infinite care of all people and it's a it's it's a and that point flows from now and I was going to bring it out later on and later in chapter 3 is the points probably best made there too but it starts here it starts here it goes through all three chapters here four chapters I'm sorry so uh, but that's definitely the reasons that he didn't want to go and we talked about that and it continues that now and we'll see it in his prayer here in a moment that you know that that attitude continues to prevail but I don't want to want to come back to the point that the question was does my sin and that's what Jonah's doing here does my sin affect others well it sure affected these mariners did they ask for this they didn't ask for this 
He has to get on the ship. They're taking their cargo to Spain. One of the first things they have to do is throw their cargo overboard so they don't sink because they think they're dead. This storm is going to kill them. To lighten the load, they had to get rid of their cargo. And in nowadays value, what's a ship's cargo worth? I don't know what it was carrying, but I don't think it was just invaluables. It was probably worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in our value today, if not millions. I don't know, but I'm just saying, we don't always think of that. But A, they didn't ask for it. B, his sin is now affecting them in their livelihood, just the very livelihood. Their sin, his sin, then, they're afraid for their life. And I'm going to make this contrast, and I'm going to say it in a way I don't want to be, but it draws out the points that sometimes as we make the application to ourselves, when we're in sin, we don't think we affect others. I'd like to think my sin didn't affect anybody. That's what I would like to think. Then it can just be quiet. Then people don't know. And then I can just go on unaffected by it. But then I read in Matthew chapter 5, I'm the light of the world. I like that one, right? I'm the salt of the earth. Well, I like that one too. So I say a lot of times we cherry pick what we like and what we don't like. I like to be the, think that I'm influential, the salt of the earth. I'm the light of the world, I would like to say. But then when we are very honest and we start to do inventory about the things that we do wrong in our life, we can't say that we're isolated and it just doesn't affect anybody. It affects a lot of people. want to do we have to do them anyway yeah yeah mm. yeah and so as Jonah here has brought the sin upon this vessel they didn't ask for that <laughs> they didn't ask to lose the cargo and then have to answer for that when they get to their destination well, where, where's the cargo or whatever was lost out of the cargo there were people dependent upon that their their lives the, you know, that's, that's something that they're, they're being threatened. <coughs> so I'll just say that, you know, our sin does affect people just as our lives, when we're living righteously, affects others too. We can't cherry pick just having it one way or another. And so our lives intertwine others. And so, from that standpoint, when we look at the sin that affects others, what are some sins that affect others in our lives? And what that comes to my mind is maybe not speaking out on things that we might need to speak out against. Yeah, yeah. I kind of mentioned that Wednesday night, you know. Uh, Aaron, by just not saying anything, Numbers chapter 20. That's not an option. That being the case, the watchman is very similar, Ezekiel chapter 33. If we love our brethren and love one another, we'll, we'll have things to say to help one another. What else? Uh, the, the gathering, uh, when the saints gather. Yeah. Uh, I know that's a good Sunday one. nights and, and Wednesday nights is sometimes it's I don't know it it, just, it, it affects me let's put it that it, way it, 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 it does yeah in uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 10 verse 24 25 26 says we see the day approaching we should be encouraging and that encouragement goes a long way now, if it's encouraging on one hand, could it be discouraging on the other? 
Well, certainly. Absence is. What about Thomas? Where was Thomas after Christ was crucified? He was absent. And for now 2,000 years, nearly later, what do we call Thomas? In his absence, he was a doubter. You know? So absence is certainly um, affecting others. Um, what else? Roy? I think the words that we say careless, carelessly Absolutely. Re really affect people. Yep. Um, what we say in um, encouragement or discouragement, ex explicitly the way, and I'm, I'm the worst at this. <laughs> I say stuff all the time that I don't mean it that way. Sometimes it's my dry sense of humor. Sometimes it's other things that it doesn't come across right. I have been really having to work on how I say things. And some of it's just the way generationally, generations speak differently to one another. And, and the children we're raising now are quite sensitive to stuff. And I'm not. And sometimes I say things that can be pretty blunt. I say, tell people all the time, I got the sensitivity two by four. It's interesting to note that not only among God's people is that a thing that we should be aware of, but the world recognizes that as well because in the book uh, For Whom the Bells Told, it should ask not if I'm diminished by the death of mankind, for I'm diminished by the death of all men. So ask not then for whom the bells told, they told for thee. Yep. I mean, right now we have entire industries that are devoted to sin. Yeah, there is. And that affects everybody. How do we affect others in our sin? What's some others? We sit every week we go to jail, don't we, Randy? Someone goes and gets drunk, what happens? Is it just a drunkard's problem that he hit someone and killed a family? No. What about drugs? The drugs we see. The lack of work, the lack of integrity, the lack of that, how does that affect? It can affect a neighborhood. I mean, we see it every week. That sin affects others. What else? Yeah. <laughs> it does affect everybody. Because then what does everybody else do? Works harder to keep the load. Yeah. I guess along, along with what you're saying, Dan, you know, just especially those mothers that's in jail, Mm -hmm. this morning here on Mother's Day and yep. not only are they hurting but their children I mean yes. what, I mean that just tears you up when you think about that and I know this is kind of not the same thing but I was sitting here when you first started talking the extreme example would have been David and Bathsheba and yes. not only did he have Uzziah killed but then whenever God was going to give him a choice of three things. Who was who? What was the three things? Who was who's getting punished? It really wasn't David in a way, was it? I mean, in a way it was, but I'm I'm saying that who yep. lost their lives right. because of David's sin. That's exactly right. Well, <laughs> two that I can think of right directly. So, but. How did David's sin affect a nation? A nation. And I've mentioned this before, and I may be wrong. I, I've not been corrected yet, but as I see David's life in that, after his sin, as king of Israel, they didn't have a victory after that that I know of. Correct me if I'm wrong. Israel didn't have a victory after his sin. How did that affect a nation? I mean, that's significant. Israel didn't have victory after that. They had all kinds of them before that. All kinds of them. And then he's out philandering, doing things he shouldn't have been doing. It affected him, Ron. I think about our, our teachers. We have teachers, retired and, and active teachers today. We have Bible school teachers who are 
in class today, such as yourself, they're teaching a class. Sometimes what we fail to realize is that every one of us is a teacher. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what our age is, from the, from the youngest to the oldest. I used to tell my oldest son, son, your little brothers are watching you, <laughs> and what you do, they're going to do. Well, without saying it, I'm saying, Ron, what you do, your sons are going to do. Now, they do some things now that I didn't do. They've learned some other way about that, but nevertheless, all of us are teachers, You're and we're, exactly right. we're being watched. If, yep. And today's Mother's Day. <coughs> yep. if, if we're teaching our children right, we're honoring our mothers and fathers and, and mm -hmm. such as that. But I think about one other thing jail ministry mentioned, and I think about James. He's in, our, in pod B, and he's been there, I don't know, it's four, five, six months. When he first came in there, he made a comment. He, we were, some of the guys were telling the things he did, and he said, well, I didn't do anything bad. Mm -hmm. Well, he's meaning like, the like the real bad stuff yeah the real bad the real stuff. bad one but yeah something you just mentioned a moment now. ago about the drunk driver well yep. it's taken several months now but james mentioned a few weeks ago he said i i quit drinking he'd had a ticket for drunk driving he said i quit drinking but he said, I didn't pay that fine that the judge gave me a long time to take care of and to complete a certain thing. He said, but I didn't do anything bad. But you think about the things that could have happened. But so then two or three weeks ago, probably three or four weeks ago, he made the comment. He said, I wish this would have happened to me a long time ago. I, if there was ever anybody that's, that was penitent about what he had done and the result of his actions uh, came to his mind, it was him. And in the, his prayer requests, he always asked that God take care of his children. Well, he's teaching his children. He's still teaching his children, yep. even though he's not present. But anyway yeah no it's it's a good everyone's point everyone's watching you know and i was going to say every week we see broken homes you know innocent children they didn't ask for that does a broken home just affect one person the one that's done something wrong or never you know in marriages when we start bringing your marriages together is it just one person that's there no marriages when virtue in terms of virtue the the covenant we make it what everything that I do affects my wife. Everything that I do. When you're talking about breaking up homes, it's it comes down so often to I want to do what I want. I deserve to, do. to be happy. Not not that I'm doing anything no. that is wrong no, per se. I, yeah. I just want to do what I want to do. And, and you know, if that's not what you want to do, well that's just too bad. Mm -hmm. I deserve to be happy. How many times times have you heard that? I'm still looking for that verse. I know. I know. I know, but it will break a home up by virtue of someone saying, I deserve to be happy. Well, for the rest of those children's lives, and statistics are, and this is proper within the church, statistically a broken home in the <coughs> church, as if we don't have the odds stacked against us on our young people already, about 60% will fail outside of their rearing in a Christian church home. Then 50% on top of that, you lose 50% through a broken home. So you start taking, you know, you're talking 70, 30 then that will not be faithful. I mean, that's eternal ramifications. Well, I, I think a lot of what we're seeing here today is, a, is this lesson untaught. <clears throat> and, and we have the, the great commission that we're to go out and teach and 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 spread this gospel. Now, we do in somewhat indirectly here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that as it pertains to me, mm -hmm. you know, it's easier to, um, 
not do something than it is to do something. Yeah. And and so that when you get right down to it, that's that person. I may be the only person that 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 feller that that lady would ever get to know the true yep. word of God. Yes. Yep. So all very, very good points, and I think we've got it that from the standpoint, my sin does affect others, and hopefully it softens our hearts to the extent that we realize that, that when, when we do something, typically that should bring us to repentance, realizing I've hurt someone else in this, um, and not to hide it, and not to shun it, and not to act like it's a skeleton in the closet I can just put back there and I don't see it, therefore it doesn't exist. That's not the way it works. It didn't work with Jonah that way. I think we, a lot of times, we say one thing. We say we're supposed to be there, but then our actions, we watch a TV show we shouldn't, and Can our be. kids see it. We go to an extracurricular activity and miss church yep. over it. Uh, what are we putting priority mm-hmm. on? You know, Brad Harrop was talking about this last week. Our priorities are not right. That's why our kids are leaving the church. Yep. We say one thing but we do a completely different one yeah yeah and and they're very keen they're very keen our kids are very very keen when they learn they see that and that's true so let's try to get through i'd like to get through a little bit more uh let's go to chapter two is he then jonah in verse 17 now the lord prepared a great fish to swallow up jonah And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And let's go down through verse 9. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou hurtst my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep. Okay, let's come back to that point here in just a moment. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed about me. All thy billows, whose billows? His billows. Thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed about, compassed me about, even to the soul, the depth closed around about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Sounds like he's not having a very good time in the belly of the fish here. He's struggling. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came into thee and into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I, and I like the way the word but's inserted here because it's really a word that when you see the word but, it kind of erases to some degree what you just said and it's listen to what I'm saying now. I've been pretty careful about when my wife says, yeah, but. Well, she's about to tell me what she really means. But. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that uh, that I vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now let's go back to just a little bit here. In uh, verse 3. For thou hast cast me into the depth, into the midst of the seas. Who did this? Who, who chose to get on the ship? Who chose to go out the very opposite direction? Who chose to disobey God? But who's Jonah accusing that put him here? He's accusing God. Well, that's sometimes, sometimes you have to have help, <laughs> right? <laughs> to misunderstand the whole point. It wasn't God at all. Well, God sent him this fish, absolutely. God sent the storm, but he's missing the point. 
The point was correction. It was a point of correction and repentance, Jonah. Jonah, you're not going where I said to go. Jonah, Jonah, that's what God's doing. But he's not accepting it initially, he doesn't. He points the finger back on God that, well, you've cast me out here, you cast me there. I've been cast out of, my si- out of thy sight. Was Jonah cast out of his sight? Well, I would say Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, based on the virtue of what he had done, it separated him in that. Not that God can't hear or can't see, but because of our sin, he chooses not to. Correct? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. He's an omniscient God. He knows everything. But when we separate ourselves from him, It wasn't God that had done this. Jonah did that. Again, Jonah initially doesn't really seem to realize and accept what he had done. Now, we'll say, and then he comes on down, and and you can see the struggle that he has in the belly. He's literally probably on death's door, truthfully in the belly as things wrap around him and he gives a very vivid description of the struggles in the belly but he says in verse 9 but I will sacrifice and that's why I say the but is then he realizes what he must do and I think that's the point that he comes to the realization that I just want a second chance I just want a second chance Well, it could be the tenth. For me, twenty, a hundred, what, four hundred and ninety? <laughs> Seventy times seven. Have you ever wanted a second chance? Have you ever said something you just wish you didn't say? All the stuff we just talked about, the things that we do, don't you just wish you had a redo button? Well, fortunately, Jonah gets that second chance. Because that's what he's asking for in virtue of, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. He doesn't sound a very thankful person up to this point in time, does he? He he sounds fairly stubborn, fairly rejecting, fairly, you know, you go down the list of the uh, ways to describe Jonah. That's his way of saying, I need a second chance. And and he's going to get it. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay. That's something we don't often think about when we mention our sin of restitution. And that's a, I wish I would have heard that lesson Don Blackwell gave on repentance and restitution. I think that's a very valuable lesson. Because a lot of times we don't think of the restitution that goes along with our repentance. But our repentance really does carry with it restitution. But he says here, I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation, and this is key, salvation is of the Lord. And that's an absolute truth. And he gets the second chance. Verse 10, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited him, I'm sorry, vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. <laughs> okay, here we go. I think I can make a little bit more here. Let's go through the first four verses of chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. Now, let me stop right there and ask a couple of questions. Does my sin change what God is going to do? Because that's kind of what Jonah was trying to do. Well, I'm just not going to do it. Did that change God's will? Not an ounce. Malachi chapter 3, verse... Yep. It's basically, I don't want to hear your excuses mm-hmm. because change. Aaron's right here and I'll send him with you. Mm-hmm. I'll make a way. Yeah. Didn't change God's will at all. Malachi 3, 6, what's that say? For I am God... I change not. Hebrews 13. 
Actually, is it 13 verse 5? No, Jesus Christ is the same. Okay. And Jesus is God, correct? The Son. God does not change, period. He's immutable. He can't change. 8, okay, thank you. Hebrews 13, 8. He can't change. He's perfect. How do you change perfect? Can it be more perfect than perfect? Perfecter? No. He's perfect to begin with. It's a slippery slope. I'm not very good at spelling. I'm better than some, but not most. But that's the, the false logic of it. He can't change because he is perfect already. What, uh, what need does he have to be more perfect than perfect? He is perfect. So I'll just say, let's say this. Our sin does not convince him to change. And that's what Jonah was by virtue of trying to do. Well, I'll just... It's like a child and a parent. Well, the child misbehaves to change the behavior of the parent. And a lot of times it works, sadly to say. Not so much with me, it didn't, but... We have children that act the very same way by virtue of their misbehavior, by trying to leverage that and manipulate someone else to change. God doesn't change. And we see that arise, go to Nineveh. Exactly the same thing that he had told him to do in verse uh, 2, chapter 1. Exact same words, arise, go to Nineveh. Jonah says it again, arise, go to Nineveh. Didn't change a bit. God does not change. Based on our disobedience, we're not going to make him change. He will and is an immutable, unchangeable God. So he gets the call then to go and preach to that city, I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. And I think that means that it was basically that was the size. It took you three days to walk across it. And Jonah began to enter into the city. A day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words. Yet forty days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Okay. No, Jonah fulfills the command. Minimally, but he fulfills it. He does what the Lord says. And just briefly in verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God. Immediately we see the result. And proclaimed a fast. And, and their response is there. I don't really have a lot of time to delve into that, but... Let me back up to one point that sometimes gets missed, I'll say. So they see him come in. What do you think Jonah looked like when he arrived to the city? This is an implicit point, but implicitly I think it's all there. If I travel 2,500 miles today, and I'm, we're blessed. We can travel 2,500 miles and a lot easier than he did. And it still takes a toll on us. <laughs> 2,500 miles is quite a long way one side of the United States to the other, basically, in some. What do you think Jonah looked like when he walked into that city? The smell. What he described of the belly of what was wrapped around him. What the, what's the pH of a whale's stomach? A human stomach's 1.5 pH, which is like hydrochloric acid. Okay, masonry, muriatic acids, hydrochloric acid. You don't get it on you, or it'll eat, it'll eat your skin off. Can you imagine what his skin would have looked like? Probably just, it could have had eroding off of him to some extent from just being there for three days. The smell? Probably wasn't easy to miss Jonah when he walked into the city, is what I'm saying. It was probably a sight. It probably got their attention to think that this guy had just traveled 2,500 miles one way, came back 500 miles, 
looked like death, smelled like death, probably got their attention to some degree just based on who is that. Now, that's working in God's favor from the standpoint he probably had a somewhat a captive audience by his arrival. It does bring a point that even through all the challenges of life can bring opportunity for him. He presented his own challenges to himself, but then this opportunity was about to happen as difficult as it was. The opportunity then that he was going to give this lesson probably maximized his point. Because like I said, walking in and looking and smelling and the way he was probably garnered a greater audience to listen. And so, because uh, it's quite a journey that he had made. We're not told. He might have. That's true. That's true. I don't know. I'm just saying it's implicit. So, but if you think of the journey, I just kind of wonder sometimes that that might not have also helped garner some of that attention that he got on foot. Yeah. So not an easy thing. Um, he might have cleaned up and it may have not mattered, but I just kind of wonder, you know, it's kind of one of the Dan's thoughts. Huh? I would have thought, you know, um, but how many days that that would have taken to get there and the time and then what he'd gone through, his own calamities. But yet we have here in his sermon, the shortest sermon and most successful sermon that's in the Bible as far as I can see. Just a quick question. Why, why would they listen to a Hebrew? Well, um, I mean, you know, you, you think about what's going to happen later and you think about the God setting the Hebrew apart from everybody I just it, it just dawns on me you know and it don't really say it doesn't address Jonah hmm. it doesn't say or I didn't I've not picked it up uh, you know that he was I, I mean we know he's a minor prophet according to the word but, yeah. but it's, it's, it doesn't really spell it out here for you and why they'd listen to him, and when, like you said, on them few words, it just amazes me. Yeah. I, I'll say, um, and this would go outside of the book more to say that there was a lot of conversations that went back and forth between nations that we know that, that the children of Israel had already asserted themselves as the children of God. So the nations around them understood that they were God's chosen people, even if they believed it or not. So I think that might be about the only thing that as he went, well, and, and in that I'll say is a point that they didn't have a commission to go. So there's not like an outreaching that the children of Israel had any commission to go, but then here he's given a commission, Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. That's unique. I mean, it really is unique, and that's why I've always kind of been stumbled by the proposition, but the reason is, is the infinite care that God has for all people is shown here through the disobedience of Israel, because they're going to be taken captive by the Assyrians, but he calls them to repent, just like he called the uh, nation of Israel to repentance too. So he's being fair. Everybody needs to repent. All men need to repent. So, but it's the only reason I can think of that they probably never heard a lesson like this, even as short as it is. So. And saying this for three days, constant. Yeah. Arise. Even if that's all the words he said, he's persistent. Repent. Yeah. And we'll see next week. Go ahead and read it again. I know we've probably read it um, for the last couple of weeks. Next week we'll get to that. And then we'll see his, his response to his great success. Uh, and then we'll go from there. But I really appreciate the good comments this morning. I'll come back to that next week, Lord willing. Yeah.